If it's Friday, Zelensky's show of force. The wartime leader huddles with Putin's allies in the Mideast as he prepares a surprise in-person visit to meet with President Biden and the Western world leaders in Japan in what could be a turning point for the war and the West. Plus, a growing Republican field signals growing Republican doubts about both of the front runners for president in the Republican Party as Donald Trump faces concerns over electability and Ron DeSantis faces questions about his capability. And insurrection double cross. Federal prosecutors are charging a Metro DC police lieutenant for allegedly tipping off the leader of the Proud Boys in the lead up to the January 6th insurrection as the officer and the insurrectionist relayed literally hundreds of secret messages. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Chuck Todd reporting from Washington. And we begin this Friday with the latest from the president's trip overseas, where Joe Biden and U.S. allies are preparing to greet a surprise guest. Not much of a surprise anymore, since we keep talking about it. Um, but they're going to greet him with open arms, and you might say in the form of fighter jets, weapons, military training, sanctions, and billions more in wartime aid. A Western official tells NBC News that Ukraine's President Zelensky is expected to make a surprise in-person visit to attend the G7 summit in Hiroshima, which is currently underway right now. It comes as Zelensky has been aggressively ramping up efforts to shore up international support amid this planned military counteroffensive against a flagging Russian military. And it all raises the question, is this the critical moment, a potential turning point in this conflict? Zelensky's posture makes, makes it sure seem like it is. His participation in the G7 will follow another surprise stop. He went to Saudi Arabia where he addressed in person the Arab League today, including Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, arguably some of Putin's friendlier uh, Arab allies in the region. And as I mentioned, Zelensky is not going to come away from the G7 empty-handed. A senior administration official tells NBC News that the U.S. and its G7 allies have already agreed to provide Ukraine with F-16 fighter jets. That was something Biden had long resisted, and that the U.S. will join efforts to train Ukrainian pilots. They think they can cut down training to just four months. The announcement followed a joint statement released by the G7 leaders outlining a slew of new sanctions on Moscow, including on Russian exports and its technology sector. This comes as the Pentagon says it overestimated the value of military aid to Ukraine by at least $3 billion. Now, why does that matter? It's an accounting error that they're gleeful about because it opens the door for the Defense Department to send more weapons to Ukraine without needing to go back, hat in hand, to Congress, which we know is pretty polarized, at least in the House, potentially on this issue. Now, as the West rallies around Ukraine, NBC News Chief White House correspondent Peter Alexander caught up with our ambassador to Japan, the former mayor of Chicago, Congressman, White House Chief of Staff, Rahm Emanuel, about why this summit matters so much. What should Americans, what will be the key takeaway? What should Americans view as the key takeaway from this visit? That working with our allies, we are a stronger, more united nation, uh, uh, rather world, and our allies seek America's leadership, and our leadership is to make sure that our allies know they're more secure with the United States working together. One year ago at this time, when G7 leaders gathered in Germany, we were just four months into this war, and there were serious questions about Ukraine's ability to survive a Russian war of attrition. But now, one year later, Zelensky seems to be the one gaining momentum, with a military on the move, as Zelensky himself has been on the move. He's been barnstorming the world on this diplomatic spree, if you will, looking for support, and it appears he's had a pretty successful round trip around the world. Joining me now is Kristen Welker. She's in Hiroshima, Japan. And Molly Hunter is on the ground in Kiev for us. And Molly, let me start with you in Kiev. Again, we talked about this earlier this week. You know, you know, is the offensive really underway or not? But it certainly seems as if Zelensky is making this last trip around the world, hitting all these key places, getting everything he needs, it certainly seems like the second he lands, it's go time. 
Yeah, Chuck, exactly. There is certainly a spring in the Ukrainian president's step. We saw him in Europe, of course. We saw him uh, in Saudi Arabia today. We will see him in Japan on Monday. It's interesting. We've been talking all day and people have been wondering, look, here you have a president. Obviously, they are preparing for a counteroffensive. Kyiv, the rest of the country is dealing with unprecedented aerial assaults. And yet they've decided that the president should go on the road. And we know exactly why. His advisors know it's worth it. He never comes back empty handed. Earlier today, one of his top advisors, was saying he has to be there. His physical presence is so important to defend our interests, to explain, to provide clear proposals and clear arguments. They know he is so persuasive. You know, I, Chuck, I think we're rolling a sound bite actually of him right here among you who turn a blind eye to those cages and illegal annexations. And I'm here so that everyone can take an honest look, no matter how hard the Russians try to influence. And Chuck, he is not going to be coming back empty handed, as you already said in your intro. And certainly that three billion dollars uh, in surplus, the Ukrainians are well aware of. Look, unprecedented air attacks. They're planning right. for a counteroffensive. They know they need more Western air defenses. Uh, certainly about that counteroffensive that we spoke about yesterday. Right. We have not seen proof. We have not heard of hundreds of armored vehicles right. getting going. The ground is hardening. It's sunny out. You know, it's certainly springtime and ready and ready, uh, primed for an offensive right. when he gets back. And Molly, what are we hearing out of Moscow? I mean, I, I know there was some there's been some bizarre Putin quotes circulating right now. But in general, with Moscow and, and where 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 they where they stand these days. Yeah, I mean, I think big picture last week, obviously, we saw two massive waves of aerial attacks. Their first uh, accusation was that they uh, destroyed entirely a U.S. made Patriot air defense system. Of course, the Ukrainians denied that. The U.S. officials uh, clarified that they had repaired it. It was fully operational. Uh, we are seeing, I think what's so interesting is we are seeing uh, one leader obviously be out in the world, present this really confident, uh, solid ground among world leaders. And we are not seeing very much of a very, uh, isolated President Putin. And I think that for the Ukrainians speaks volumes, but certainly a lot of displeasure right. uh, with what they are seeing. Ukraine says they have the momentum on the battlefield. Obviously, new sanctions are coming down and they're going to come back with a lot of military hard work, Chuck. Molly Hunter on the ground force in Kiev. Molly Hunter, uh, please stay safe. Thank you. Let me move across the globe to Kristen Welker in Hiroshima. And Kristen, let's start with the F-16 decision. I mean, it's sort of, uh, it's getting old hat. Uh, Ukraine makes a request for a weapon. America says no. Ukraine makes a request for a weapon. America says not yet. Ukraine makes a request for a weapon. America says, well, can the Europeans go first? And it seems like here we are again with the F-16s. Here we are again, and it, you're absolutely right, Chuck, to point out the broader influence by European allies, because in this instance, it seems like that's really what made a difference. Effectively, the Biden administration saying, look, we are going to support our European allies as they provide F-16 fighter jets. It's not clear exactly which countries are going to be providing these jets, who will be doing the training, and what the specific timeline is. But, Chuck, this is a major reversal. There's no doubt about that. This is a big victory for President Zelensky, who will be here in person, making his case in person. This is a victory for him, but don't expect him to claim victory and just let it go. Right. We anticipate he's going to be asking for more aid. He'll be asking for more weapons. And in talking to administration officials here, that is what they are expecting when Zelensky comes here. In addition to the G7 allies, He'll be addressing the leaders of India and Brazil as well. Why is that significant? Because it speaks to the point, Chuck, that you are making. He's not just appealing to Western nations. He's also appealing to those countries that have shown more willingness to support Russia. And so this is going to be a really critical right. stop here, uh, even as he is making this big diplomatic victory and a victory potentially on the battlefield as well. Chuck. India has been a big buyer of Russian oil uh, a little bit and is inadvertently or maybe whatever you uh, sort of indirectly helped Russia with some financing there. I imagine President Zelensky might try to address that directly. But let me ask you about the debt ceiling situation, because we know President Biden's had to cut short some meetings to get briefed. What are what is the traveling White House saying about the pause that was announced uh, by McCarthy's team regarding debt ceiling talks? 
Well, Chuck, just taking a step back, what I'm hearing from both sides of Pennsylvania Avenue and from the folks here in Hiroshima is this is consistent with what we've seen historically from these high stakes talks. There's often a big sticking point, a stumbling block when you get down to these details. They're trying to tamp down concerns. So let me read you part of a statement released by a White House official who says, Quote, there are real differences between the parties on budget issues and talks will be difficult. The president's team is working hard towards a reasonable bipartisan solution that can pass the House and Senate. Mm -hmm. We know in talking to our sources, the big sticking points come down to those spending caps. We know that Republicans want there to be larger slashes in spending, the White House resistance to that. Part of this, Chuck, is about both sides being able to say to their respective parties they put up a real fight for their key priorities. What is key here, though, no new talks scheduled at this point. So that's a big question mark. When right. will these talks resume? They've got to start talking again soon if they want to get this done by the June 1st deadline, Chuck. Yeah, a lot of this looks like it's... Uh Theatrics for theatrics' sake here. Seems like one day after the Freedom Caucus chirped, all of a sudden McCarthy had to announce a pause here. Um, we'll see what things look like on Monday. Kristen Welker in Hiroshima, Molly Hunter and Keith Forrest, thank you both. Joining me now on set to talk more about Zelensky's barnstorming of the globe is former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Yovanovitch. She's also out with a paperback edition of her book, Lessons from the Edge, which includes... Uh, a brand new afterword because her book came out literally, I want to say it was the month that the war began. Yeah, several much, right? weeks after the war started. Yeah, and so um, you were able to, to take some time. I want to talk about that uh, in a few minutes, but let's start with what Zelensky is doing. This has yeah. been quite, you know, everything has been in person with this trip. Mm -hmm. The fact that he's so comfortable traveling the globe in person, when when you wrote your book, and right there, we were, you, you wrote your afterword, we were worried about assassination squads. We didn't right. know if he was going to be able to stick. And now he's traveling the globe with no fear. Yeah, and obviously quite confident about leaving the country during a time of war and reaching out to international leaders. And, I mean, this is just diplomacy on steroids, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, meeting with absolutely everybody. Um, you ran down the list earlier in the segment, and um, soon he will, uh, he will be, or his deputies will be meeting with um, African leaders led by the South Africans. Right. Um, I think, you know, we can probably expect uh, some others as well. This feels, I mean, uh, you know, I don't want to be too lazy here, but it does feel Churchillian. This is Winston Churchill. I mean, he, you know, he may have a lot of problems once the war is over handling politics, because guess what? Domestic politics gets tricky in any country. But right now, there is that feeling that he is, he is this wartime leader that continues to have the confidence of people that were divided in this country about him before. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think he's, he's you know, the, the people of Ukraine support him. Um, you know, public opinion polling is uh, pretty clear on that. Right. Uh, and um, I think uh, given the force of his personality, his communication skills, and he's just right on the substance, right? right. I mean, as you said, you know, he, he uh, is requesting our assistance because it is important for Ukraine, um, but it's also important for the United States and for other countries. I mean, um, he told Congress back, uh, back in December when he was in the U.S. Uh, that this is, um, you know, uh, assisting Ukraine is not a charity. It's an investment in global security. And I think that's right. Uh, I was at the end of my segment there with Kristen where I was talking about sometimes in the, some of this theater becomes intentional in political mm -hmm. and domestic political talks. Right. How much of Biden having to say no at first is theatrical? Meaning you got to sort of, the Russia needs to see that, you know, we're not, you know, this isn't just us versus yeah, I, I mean, it's it's hard for me to know what's in anybody's head. Sure. <laughs> um, and I, I, I guess what I would say is that I think it's important uh, for um, the administration to tell the American people what the stakes are here mm -hmm. and to have that important conversation with the American people so that there is no question about the continued support uh, for, for Ukraine in this war. That's important for us. Right. It's our national security. Um, and I think part of that would also be having a plan, uh, a military plan, a political plan, an economic plan for Ukraine to win. Um, and what does that mean that we and other countries need to do to support Ukraine? Uh, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves here, but when this war ends, Ukraine's going to need a lot more financial yeah. support. It's going to need a whole bunch of, and I, I've, we've already heard some chatter that seized Russian assets should be the first, right. first money that goes into Ukraine for the, for the rebuild. How concerned are you, though, that the globe, you know, it, when, when the war is over, they, they won't be so charitable? 
Well, I think um, I, I think it's going to be important to show success in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And you're definitely not getting ahead of yourself because um, Ukraine is not waiting. They are already um, providing funds to individuals whose houses or apartments were destroyed by uh, by Russian attacks. So uh, rebuilding is is um, already commencing in Ukraine. And of course, we've all seen, you know, the brave uh, linemen <laughs> Keeping the fixing. power going. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's it's it's, it's inspiring. Uh, next week, um, there's uh, not next week, next month, there's going to be a conference in London on reconstruction. So people are thinking about this, not only in Ukraine, but globally. And how do we do this? How do we do it in a smart way? Um, you know, uh, reconstructing Ukraine, but the Ukraine of the future, not the Ukraine of the past. What's your sense of who ends up having to, who is the best position to play mediator here? It's interesting. You have Erdogan that thinks he's going to end up being the mediator. You know, I think China is trying mm -hmm. to play some role here. Um, I don't think, in a weird way, the United States, which normally wants to play weird, probably the Russians aren't going to, you know, who do you think of these various entities? I know South Africa's president thinks that he could be one. Is there somebody that, that the West can feel comfortable with and Putin can feel comfortable with playing mediator when the time comes? I think that, um, and I think you're right to say when the time comes, because neither Russia We're nor Ukraine yet, right? is, is, is ready for uh, comprehensive uh, peace negotiations. Um, but I, I think it's not going to be just one country playing that role, because I think this is so big and there are so many elements to it. I think that it's probably going to be a number of countries that have to participate and participate, um, you know, in the aftermath. I, I ask about Erdogan because, uh, look, he, uh, he's got his own political issues. America's got their own issues with him. Right. But that grain deal has helped. It has helped. Yeah. Um, you know, every couple months it is, you know, there's a crisis. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, um, and then it gets continued again. Yeah. Um, you, one of the things you write about in your afterword in your, in your, in your book is the concern you have that Europeans are going to, uh, push for talks so quickly that it gives the Russians, uh, it allows them to pocket some things before they actually have to negotiate. Now you wrote this a few months ago, mm -hmm. given how the West is sort of hung in there, do you think, do you think that's still an issue you're concerned about? Um, I, I, I think, yeah, I think we need to be very careful, and certainly Ukrainians feel, uh, are, are concerned about this, that in, in our zeal to assist Ukraine and getting to peace and saving lives, right, that's a, a valid goal, right. um, that we will accept Russian assurances that, you know, it's all over. Mm -hmm. And if we just, um, you know, kind of uh, stop... Um, Stop, uh, stop for a ceasefire, uh, Russia wins because Russia has gained uh, illegally on uh, territory that it has seized. And that is a problem because Russia, if you look at what Putin has done over the years, if what he said, what he's right. written, um, he's going to come back for more when he's ready, when he's rebuilt the military and when he's ready. Um, I got to ask you this last question about the former president and what he said when he was asked, does he want Ukraine? You know, does he want yeah. Ukraine to win the war? And he, and he wouldn't take a side. Um, what would the consequences be for Ukraine if President Trump is back into office with that posture? Um, certainly, I, I think it would be disastrous for Ukraine because Ukraine, um, first and foremost, is um, you know still here a year and several months later right. um, because of the people, because of the military, because of their will and their skills. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also because of <clears throat> a lot of Western assistance, particularly assistance from the United States. And you know, I'm not hearing in uh, what the former president is saying any desire to continue that assistance. That he wants to just immediately stop the war, almost at any cost, whatever, and the cost could come, it sounds like it's some sovereignty of Ukraine. Yeah. And um, I would say that it will have um, serious implications for uh, global security, because if Russia gets to invade Ukraine and win mm -hmm. uh, and be rewarded, um, I think other countries are going to think, well, the West is not going to stand up for its allies. It's not going to stand up for its interests. It's not going to stand up for its values. We can do the same thing. Uh, Ambassador Yovanovitch, uh, I will not ask you what you think of the diplomat uh, and about ambassadors uh, being groomed to be vice president. That would have been a lot of fun. But your book is one of the great diplomatic memoirs that are Thank out you. there. So I, if you haven't read it, check it out. Pick it up. Lessons from the Edge. Nice to see you, Ambassador. Thank you very much. You got it. Coming up, the Republican field for president is growing with Senator Tim Scott officially filing campaign paperwork today. And Governor Ron DeSantis is going to launch, it appears, as soon as next week. The latest on the 2024 campaign trail, next. Plus, new headwinds facing the Republican frontrunner Donald Trump. His party leaders begin to openly question his electability amid news of more potential criminal charges later this summer. You're watching Meet the Press now.
Welcome back. The 2024 Republican presidential field is growing. South Carolina Senator Tim Scott filed paperwork today to make his campaign official. Scott plans to announce uh, his presidential bid Monday. All of this comes as Scott is placing a massive $6 million ad buy in both Iowa and New Hampshire. It's set to go up after his Monday announcement, and they're not coming down all summer long. They have a huge hard money advantage that, for those that understand what that phrase means, is a big deal uh, and could give him a pretty good summer lifeline. Meanwhile, sources confirmed to NBC News that Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, already a uh, main target of frontrunner Donald Trump, is also set to formally enter the race next week. According to the New York Times, DeSantis is trying to woo donors with the argument that he is more electable than Trump is. So let's break down the expanding Republican field. Let's turn to our NBC team, Ali Vitale on Capitol Hill, covering the Scott campaign. Mark Murray has the latest on all things Ron DeSantis. Vaughn Hilliard will join us on the latest from Trump World. Ali, let me start with you. Boy, the, you know, the Tim Scott campaign is this sort of quiet campaign. They don't try to make, you know, pick a fight with DeSantis or pick a fight with Trump. They just sort of go ahead and, and suddenly... You could sort of see them trying to put themselves in the position to benefit from a Trump-DeSantis feud. It's a pretty big organization, isn't it? It's a pretty big organization, and you know the impact that having $20 million plus cash on hand when you get in the race can be. That's a huge boon to them. And, of course, they're putting it to work right away when you look at the ad buys. That's certainly a flex in the campaign world. That's, in the words of what someone was saying to me today, the ad buy itself is worth more than what some campaigns actually have on hand right now. So they feel good from the money perspective. And, look, they're also happy, I think, to let Trump and DeSantis duke it out. And frankly, you look at the Trump campaign statement and they're happy to see the field getting yep. bigger. We've known that this has been their their operating theory the entire time, which is the bigger the field gets, the better it gets for Donald Trump. And as they're going after DeSantis, their reaction to Tim Scott yep. getting in the race was not about necessarily Tim Scott. It was about Ron DeSantis. They said what Tim Scott is seeing is what everyone is seeing, which is that second place is wide open. So they're not just welcoming Tim Scott right. to the race, but they're also saying it's a knock against DeSantis. You know, a month ago, a lot of us were, oh, Nikki Haley. Um, but boy, she's had some fundraising issues. And, you know, t this Tim Scott uh, announcement, this really could start separating him from her. Um, how's the Haley campaign handling this? Well, look, it separates him from her in that he is able to just go the distance because he has the money baked in already. They raised, you know, somewhere around five million in that first uh, in that first quarter. Some of that money was duplicate and, and double counted. And so that looked like a snafu and some messy handling on the campaign's part. They're still plugging along. And I think the thing that's always been true about Nikki Haley is that Clearly, there is a baked-in rivalry between Haley and Scott simply because they are both from South Carolina. The Haley side would tell you that Tim Scott got his start in national politics because of Nikki Haley appointing him to the Senate. The Scott folks would say he has more than honed his own profile, both here in the Senate and nationally as he's been on the road. We'll see which theory of the case wins out. I do think it's striking that both of them, though, recognizing kind of the realities on the ground in South Carolina where yeah. Trump continues to be dominant, they are spending a lot of time in Iowa and New Hampshire. Those are clearly the states where they're not waiting for the calendar to come to them, and they're also trying to hedge because even though technically they have home field advantage, no. they don't actually. No, they don't. Just ask those Floridians that ran in 2016 exactly. what home field advantage is like in a Republican <laughs> primary against Donald Trump. Ali Vitale uh, on the Tim Scott campaign. Allie, uh, we will see you next week in Iowa, I have a feeling, and New Hampshire. Thanks very much. And Charleston. Exactly, and Charleston. <laughs> Let me move over to Mark Murray and the DeSantis campaign. So, Mark, let's go back into your crystal ball here a minute. And if Ron DeSantis announces his presidential candidacy in January and not when it's coming, um, the words formidable would have been probably, and juggernaut, would have been the two most commonly used words to describe this campaign. I think formidable still is, is appropriate. But not juggernaut. Yeah, yeah, formidable. I, 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 you're exactly right, Chuck. And of course, when we end up seeing the launch, there'll be a lot of media attention. But you're exactly right that the last five months overall really haven't been all that kind to Ron DeSantis and his kind of expanding, soon-to-be campaign that we'll finally end up getting next week. And of course, there have been a lot of trappings that you've ended up seeing from the Florida governor. Um, he's gone to early states like Iowa and New Hampshire. He's had a book tour. He's spoken at the Reagan Library, all getting a lot of attention the way that 
that a normal candidate would uh, end up uh, getting. But he also hasn't had the protection that a campaign provides. You know, Chuck, you and I have been doing this for a long time. And normally when you have that campaign infrastructure behind you mm -hmm. and uh, teams go on the attack, well, you have somebody uh, uh, that has your back. You end up having surrogates that can actually get your message across. But when you're in that kind of soon-to-be campaign that Ron DeSantis is, is, has had, there hasn't been all that much backup. And so it's going to be interesting to see what the DeSantis operation looks like after next week, what after those Donald Trump attacks come, what the, the uh, forcefulness behind the response is. I'm going to be really curious. And of course, as Ron DeSantis, you know, he has, has a day job as Florida governor. The Florida legislative session has ended, which gives him freedom and flexibility to be able to do this. But I think you're right that the last four to five months have actually been a, a more challenging time for him rather than a positive one building up to this announcement. And one would assume, Mark, that he, he you know, he had to let some, he was trying to stay above the fray and it didn't really work. Uh, you assume he's going to now start counterpunching on Trump more, but that could end up just benefiting Tim Scott, right? Yeah, Chuck, and Ali just made a really good point, and the Trump campaign is seizing on this, that the fact that you end up having the likes of Tim Scott, uh, uh, possibly uh, soon to be uh, Mike Pence getting in, the fact that the Republican field is getting bigger and smaller necessarily isn't a reflection on Donald Trump, the front runner. the Trump campaign points out. I think they make a pretty good case. It seems to actually be more of an indication of Ron DeSantis' standing right now. And, of course, we have a long ways to go. But the weaker that Ron DeSantis ends up looking, someone like Tim Scott says, hey, what about me? Nikki Haley, what about me? Mike Pence, what about me? Even the news that the North Dakota's right. governor might be getting in. Uh, and so we're going to have to actually see that the expanding field, is this about Donald Trump or is this about Ron DeSantis? Yeah, no, you can't help but wonder what would have happened. Again, going back to my first question to you, had DeSantis announced in January, Mark Murray, um, uh, with that um, reporting and analysis for us, Mark, thank you. Let me move over to our man on the Trump campaign, Vaughn Hilliard. You know, Vaughn, you've been covering Trump since then. Uh, you know, the Trump campaign January of this year versus the Trump campaign May of this year, they were on the defensive and on their heels in January um, versus where they are today. I mean, this is playing out about as well as they could have hoped for the last five months, no? Right. And look at the average of polls over just the last month and a half since he was indicted, jumping up 20 points more over Ron DeSantis here. And that is why actually the head of uh, the Trump Alliance Super PAC today, to Mark's point, put out that this is evidence that Ron DeSantis is bleeding. He is not that juggernaut that some had suggested that he would be and that others feel like they have a shot to get into this now. And what Donald Trump is doing is trying to pummel uh, Ron DeSantis uh, early. He tried to do it before he got in. It looks like DeSantis will get in regardless. But it's belittling him, having a, a, an ad that is up that in which he plays not only Ron DeSantis when he won his primary election back in 2018, mm -hmm. suggesting that Trump had his back when perhaps it was an unpopular thing to do so, but then also playing the part of the ad in which Ron DeSantis went on the airwaves in Florida, really uh, essentially holding up Donald Trump as the leader of the party, right. reading a Donald Trump book to his young toddler. Uh, for, for, for Donald Trump, this is very much about belittling, belittling the others in this race, including even Tim Scott, who he just put out in the last hour as an article back from 2021 in which Tim Scott said, quote, of course he would not run against Trump and that he'd support him this go around, which, of course, it appears that's not going to be the case. Vaughn Hilliard, uh, it's uh, the twists in this Republican primary. They're in some ways just beginning. It's going to be uh, a rock and roll week next week, that's for sure. And I know Trump's not going to be quiet, as everybody else announces. So, Mr. Hilliard, thank you, sir. Thanks, Ron. After the break, we have more on the race for the White House as more Republican candidates are prepared to jump in. And a prominent Republican senator publicly warns his party that Donald Trump is unelectable. Panel's next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We're going to talk a lot more on the 2024 race. I'm joined by my panel, Nicholas Wu, congressional reporter for Politico, Simone Sanders Townsend, host of Simone on MSNBC, and a former advisor to Vice President Harris, and Danielle Pletka, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and NBC News contributor. Now, I promise I want to do one quick whip around a debt ceiling because you guys are all the jaded cynics like me that I am. But uh, I think what we're seeing here is nothing more than necessary theater for the talks to end, that the pause is actually a feature not a bug in these talks. Nicholas, what say you? I think that's right, Chuck. I mean, 
you know, we, just this week we saw the Freedom Caucus come out with their own statement. Minutes before we came on air, the Progressive Caucus came out with their own statement saying that they weren't going to accept a bad deal and that Biden needed to go straight to the 14th Amendment right. now and, and ignore the debt ceiling. And I think this gives all parties a little bit of space, while things are a little bit heated right mm -hmm. now, to, to wait, take a beat, and then come back next week when the president returns from his trip and then hammer out some kind of deal. I, I, you've been, you, you've worked on Congress. You've, I mean, you both have worked in this. There is, like, some of this is necessary theater, right? Well, I mean, there's a reason it's called brinksmanship, right? And everybody is inching up as close, and they see the other guy isn't as close, and so they, they keep going back and forth. But the president isn't here. So McCarthy was too optimistic yesterday, so he had to like it. <laughs> the Freedom Caucus didn't like that? But, but I mean, it is, it is theater, because yeah. I think we know how it's going to end. I think, talking beforehand, we all said what perplexes us is that Wall Street keeps going, acting as if this doesn't happen every single time. And they're shocked, shocked to see that there's no agreement. Oh, my yeah. God. Now, that's why I can't Threatening a downgrade Some sort right of hedge now. fund and Day trader game that that's being exactly. played there. Um, does Biden fear progressive backlash or no on this one? I, I think he fears doing something that will undercut himself. Mm -hmm. And and I, I do think that, you know, caving on the work requirements, which is something that it's not just now that Democrats in the House and even in the Senate have said that that's a red line for them. This has been a through line. This is something that their Republican colleagues on Capitol Hill have talked about a number of times in this Congress already and in the last Congress. And it's not something that Democrats are willing to play ball on. And I think that the work requirements piece is a it, I think it's very it was very important for the Congressional Progressive Caucus to come out and say, no, this is a line for us. The CBC also came out, yeah. um, the senator. Biden's so. distinction, did that matter? He says, not for health care, but I, you know, I voted for work requirements before. Senator Biden. Had. I think his distinction was honest. Yeah. And if there's one thing about Joe Biden, he'll, yeah. he'll he tells you how he sees it. I, I do just think while this, I do think they're going to shake out on a deal where we've all long thought they were going to land it. Right. Land, it's it's hurtful for the American people. Like we should not have to continue to go well, through this every single time. When what is annoying here is the only people that make money on this deal are the hedge fund gamers. That's I mean, what drives me. But we we do we do owe an awful awful. Awful lot of money. I mean, well, $31.46 trillion. We're, we're, we're still, as an economist friend said to me once, we're still the cleanest pair of dirty underwear in the, laundry, in the, in the hamper Ew. compared to the rest of the country. <laughs> well, well that's, that's unfortunately our situation uh, these days. I guess it's better to say we're the one-eyed person at the land of the blind. Uh, or the maybe, or the or the yeah. best or the be, 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 the best cookie in cookie box. I don't uh, know. Oh, you like that one better? Yeah. Yeah, all cookies are good. Let me move to the presidential race. <laughs> um, the ever-expanding field. Is this a reflection of Ron DeSantis, Danny? I don't know. I, at the beginning, there was no question, and we talked about this when Mike Pompeo pulled out, mm -hmm. right, was that Republicans kind of internally had agreed that fewer candidates was going to be what enabled them to edge out Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. I think at this point, he seems to have so much momentum, and he seems to be so immune <laughs> to amazing. public judgment, which is stunning, truly. I mean, I don't think any of us really understand the, the dynamics here. It's going to be what historians and sociologists study about this era for years. Yeah, like, it, why was he immune and nobody else is? I, 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 I mean, I, had, I, can't, I don't have any answers here, but I do think that that you were right. The, the assumption was that DeSantis was going to be a juggernaut. Mm -hmm. And coming out of the election in November, he was a juggernaut. The problem is he's allowed Trump to define him for six months. Yeah. And, you know, that's a big problem. I, I, I feel like we're already seeing Jeb Bush here in, in DeSantis in that he's done so much damage to DeSantis. I, I don't know how he gets space to redefine himself. I think... The, the thing to watch in the coming months will be to see how people like Tim Scott, like DeSantis, do now that, as they become officially declared candidates. Since I think, you know, for the past half year, yes, I think it's very true. Trump has been able to define these folks, and, and, and they could kind of hide themselves um, behind the fig leaf of not being an officially declared candidate yet and could dodge on that when asked about any of these um, attacks from, uh, by reporters. Now that they will be uh, declared candidates, right, let's see how these campaigns fare you know, under mm -hmm. a harsher light. Simona, are you comfortable with this quiet conversation that Demo Democratic strategists have that are sitting there going that they kind of hope it's Trump? 
No, I'm very uncomfortable with that. I, I am someone, and perhaps I'm an outlier, but I am someone that when these same Democratic strategists were saying, well, let's boost a MAGA candidate for the midterm elections because that's a better candidate um, that these Democratic candidates could beat, I thought that that was a slippery slope and that's dangerous because democracy is literally on the line. So I, I just think that I've always thought that Ron DeSantis is virtually untested outside of Florida. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the, I think, the pain that has been inflicted on him has actually been self-inflicted wounds. No one told him to pick a fight with Disney. I think I sat at this very table and said, you fight with the mouse, I think the mouse gonna win. And people came out and said, no, you're siding with corporations. Look at the mouse taking away their uh, you know, billion dollar investment in the state. So I just think it is still very early. We have to wait for the first debate stage. Right. Also, though, it's very late. Um, it, the first caucus is, the is, is, I don't know. is January. It's funny you say it's early. I don't think you're absolutely right. I don't think it's late, uh, early now. I think it's sort of this thing because the Trump who knows? You say he's immune. How many indictments can he carry into this race, right? I think we, you know, someday the camel's back's going to break. We just don't know when. Oh, come on. From your mouth to God's ears. I don't think we, we know that. And I think the, you know, look, is this late? Is this early? We can go back four years, eight years and say, look like who the front runner was. Right. It's getting right. late early. Uh, yeah. It is. On the other hand, we haven't seen, I think Nick is right, we haven't seen these folks tested. We haven't seen them out on the campaign trail. And we haven't seen them out of their own states, yeah. really. Let's, let's, my view is give them a yeah. chance. I will, I want to focus a second here on Tim Scott. Because... I don't, I don't think, and I certainly haven't, I didn't fully appreciate the, the sort of tactical advantage that he has right now, and that is good old-fashioned hard money. And what this means is he can, it's money, his campaign. This was Senate campaign money, he can spend it. He has more of that than Ron DeSantis has. He has more of that than Nikki Haley has. And he can be on the air with the ad campaign. And why does this matter? The first candidate out of the box, Simone, mm -hmm. in Iowa on TV was who? A guy named Pete Buttigieg. Mm -hmm. And everybody thought, oh, that's not going anywhere and all this stuff. And Nick Pete Buttigieg suddenly became a front runner because he was on the air in Iowa and linear television still matters to older people that live in Iowa. It matters oh, yeah. across the country. Yeah. So and it Tim worked. Scott can be the next Secretary so, of Transportation? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I mean, I defer no. to the, to yeah, the, to, no, I, I mean, defer to you, the person on Capitol Hill. Look, oh. Scott is the favorite candidate of Senate Republicans. That's true. I mean, Senate Republicans all like Tim Scott. If you know, he gets his moment, can he, can he get it? He's someone who they all respect. He's someone who, you know, might be able to roll out some endorsements from his Senate colleagues soon. But at the same time, he's someone who Senate Republicans have acknowledged in the past might not actually win, um, even as they like the guy. Well, mm -hmm. but I think the issue about Tim Scott that really does differentiate him from at least, let's say, Trump and, and DeSantis is he's a real happy warrior. Mm -hmm. And and you know something? Somebody who smiles matters he, right he, now. He, he's, and he's a genuinely nice, decent man who has a positive vision for America. I know that sounds corny and, you know, ooh, Ronald Reagan, Morning in America, but... I'm ready for that guy. You know, I, I don't know if he's going to be the guy, but I'm happy to see him there. Are there 50% plus one Republicans ready for happy? At my house, maybe. <laughs> well, how about this? What are Tim Scott's policy proposals? He whiffed, he whiffed on his big opportunity to come out very strong, or at least clear, on the question of abortion. Remember, his, he was asked, I believe he was in Iowa, question was a little shaky. I'm told they gave a, better, a speech. Totally he's going to have a better answer next week. Okay, well, <laughs> come on now. This is the big leagues, folks. And if, if, if you he's know not one alone. thing. He's not alone in not having an answer. If there's one thing. This this entire, field, is abortion. this entire field has struggled with this. Well, the Republican Party doesn't know exactly what to do on this question. And I will give Ron DeSantis credit. He at least knows where he stands. He knows where Florida mm -hmm. stands. What's amazing is that Donald Trump came out to the left of him and criticized him for that. I don't blame Tim Scott for not wanting to get in the middle of that firestorm. Well, the only thing I wonder about the Ron DeSantis posture is it's the Tim Cruz posture. And, it, you know, Tim, uh, Ted Cruz, <laughs> excuse me, is the president of Iowa. And that's about it. Uh, Nicholas, Simone, and Danny, thank you all. Enjoy the weekend. After the break, a stunning indictment for D.C.'s Metro Police Department. A lieutenant, D.C. Metro, has been criminally charged with obstructing justice in line to federal officials after he apparently tipped off the leader of the Proud Boys ahead of the Capitol insurrection. A D.C. cop working with the Proud Boys. Details and fallout ahead. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. A D.C. Metropolitan Police officer has been indicted this week on allegations that he tipped off the leader of the extremist group, the Proud Boys, Enrico Tarrio, warning him about his pending arrest. The officer, 47-year-old Shane Lamont, 
faces one count of obstruction of justice and three counts of making false statements. He was arraigned in court today. According to authorities, Lamont and Tario communicated extensively and secretly, exchanging hundreds of messages. Two days after January 6th, Lamont texted Tario a message of support, writing, Of course I can't say it officially, but personally I support you all and don't want to see your group's name or reputation dragged through the mud. NBC News Justice reporter Ryan Riley joins me now with more. And Ryan, this had been the initial belief of many people about January 6th early on, that there were calls from inside the House, if you will, in law enforcement. Um, but D.C. Metro, wow. Yeah, it's really quite extraordinary. And, you know, uh, this this lieutenant was in a position, uh, in an intelligence position in which he was, you know, there was sort of a reason for him to have been in communication uh, with Enrique Tario ahead of this. He was sort of in charge of making sure that assets were in place when they came into town to sort of, you know, quell, uh, quelling, vi you know, basically getting violence reduced and trying to keep uh, Antifa separated from uh, the Proud Boys when they're in town. But this relationship, I mean, just really went too close that we see um, in these text messages and especially tipping him off about his arrest that was pending um, when he was actually arrived in D.C. Uh, he was he's told about that. Uh, Enrique Tario was told about that while he was on uh, the plane, and this was an investigation that he was sort of updated against. And in fact, the uh, the the uh, lieutenant here was basically working against this investigation, which all dated back to this incident in December 2020, which involved uh, the burning of a Black Lives Matter banner um, that was hanging up outside of a church that the Proud Boys had ripped down and, and burned. So that was something that he was eventually arrested for, and that was sort of the, the FBI's way of trying to stop, basically, uh, you know, sort of cut off the the snake at the head. Essentially, obviously, that didn't work with the Proud Boys, who uh, then went on and stormed the Capitol, despite the fact that um, Enrique Tarrio was sort of taken off the battlefield to a certain uh, uh, effect here. He actually spent January right. 6th, of course, in a Baltimore hotel and wasn't present, uh, wasn't on the grounds of the Capitol that day. You know, I'm curious here. So you're implied, so that there was, the cop was, Lamont was supposed to reach out to Tarrio at times to deal with whenever Proud Boys were doing uh, their own forms of protests, or there was there, was some of this contact considered legitimate part of his job. That's going to be the complicating thing here because he was communicating about these communications with Tario to other people in his chain of command. He was sent. We this came out in the Proud Boys trial that he was sending information and saying, you know, a guy on the inside. He wasn't saying, you know, this is. I'm talking to Enrique Tario, but he was saying, you know, here's what my source is saying. Here's what my source is saying, and that was valuable information uh, to the D.C. police because that could, of course, you know, have them have p people in position to be able to keep groups separated. It's the same thing that we've seen when we've seen these other groups like Patriot Front marching through D.C. just a few days ago. Ago, uh, where the um, mm -hmm. where MPD officers are sort of keeping them separated and trying to reduce conflict. So you know there is uh, there is a reason for some of these yeah. officers to be in contact with some of these extremist groups. But you know you've got to really navigate that those relationships really really carefully. And obviously you shouldn't have somebody who's sympathetic to uh, extremist groups uh, in the in those in those important roles. Uh, any reason to believe there are more inside Metro PD or no? I think the bigger thing is with uh, the FBI, and you know we saw that this week in terms of people who are sympathetic to people who stormed the Capitol on January six, and that's something that you know the top officials at the FBI were warned about in the immediate aftermath. Ryan Riley, who uh, has been covering a lot of this January six related reporting for us, Ryan, thank you. Still to come, what's driving the decrease in encounters at the southern border one week after those pandemic era restrictions expired, and what it means for migrants? You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. It's been just over one week since the pandemic era border policy known as Title 42 was lifted officially and replaced with new policies aimed at limiting asylum claims at the southern border. Officials had braced for an influx of migrants in the wake of the expiration since it allowed border agents to deny nearly all asylum claims without processing. But so far, the influx that was predicted has not yet materialized. Today, the Department of Homeland Security said the encounters between ports of entry have declined by 70% down to approximately 3,000 per day. Another notable number, over 11,000 migrants were turned away from the border in the last week. They were either sent back to their home country or, in the case of 1,100 migrants from Venezuela, Cuba, Haiti, and Nicaragua, returned to Mexico under a new agreement with that country. In the release, DHS says it is encouraged by the progress, but that it is still too soon to draw definitive conclusions. Joined now by my colleague from Telemundo, Julio Vicero, in Mexico City. So, Julio, look... I think everybody's nervous about trying to say, hey, it's working because, it, you know, we know how fragile things can get. 
uh, in the, uh, at the border there. But from the conversations you've had, what are you hearing as to what's, what is making this appear to be working in the moment? Hey, Chuck. So, I mean, you're right. It's, it's too early, but the facts are that so far, migrant crossings have fallen and not risen as most people were expecting. And uh, um, we have to remember that the Biden administration actually tried to end Title 42 a long time ago, and they weren't able to do it. Uh, Secretary Mayorkas actually told me uh, a couple of weeks ago when I interviewed him that Title 8 was a better way to control migration at the border because uh, Title 8 actually brings criminal penalties to migrants who try to cross illegally. So there are legal pathways for them to ask for asylum using the app CBP-1 or uh, asking for asylum in other countries such as Mexico before getting to the border. Uh, but if they try to cross illegally, then if they are catched, they will be, they, they will be deported and they will face a, a ban. They won't mm -hmm. be able to try to cross into the United States for five years. It seems that that has actually stopped a lot of migrants for, from even trying. So uh, I, I would assume, and I, I know that there are critics of DHS in, on the Republican side of things, that are, are, are looking to say, well, the, you know, they want to undermine it and say it's not working. But if this is the case, that this policy is actually working, is this something that needs to be codified by Congress or could the, the courts undo this policy? Well, um, you know, Chuck, I, I do have to say that it might be working for the American side of mm -hmm. the border, yeah. but the crisis is still there. That's, I mean, there's a crisis at the border, no doubt. And uh, there are st the fact that the encounters with Border Patrol have stopped uh, of, or have dropped doesn't really mean that people have stayed at home. Uh, people are still escaping from, uh, from violence and from right. poverty, from Venezuela, from Nicaragua, Cuba, IT, Central America. And, and now they are in limbo. They are waiting in northern Mexico. And, and that's what I think that we will be seeing, right. a, a crisis at the, it, at the northern part of and Mexico. You, and the fact that this is northern Mexico, a part of the country that the Mexican government kind of doesn't, you know, allows the cartels to control. How concerned or, or should we be for the safety of these migrants? Well, I think we should be very concerned, and, and the images are there. Uh, if you go to Matamoros, which is the, the border with Brownsville, Texas, there are camps of migrants living in tents, and waiting. And they have been waiting there for, for months in terrible conditions, and that's one of the uh, most dangerous cities in, in the country. Um, and we have to remember, I'm sure you recall, Chuck, the, the fire in a, a detention center in Ciudad Juarez a couple yep. of weeks ago where 40 migrants died under the watch of Mexican government. So is the Mexican government ready to receive more migrants right. from the United States? Uh, that's a question to, to, to be asked, right? Uh, and I assume they need more resources. Is the United States sending financial resources to help them? I actually asked Secretary Mayorkas about that. Mm -hmm. Are the United States sending uh, resources, financial aid, or any right. type of help? And he didn't want to answer that. I asked him if, if that fire at the detention center was enough evidence, wasn't enough right. evidence to show that the Mexican government uh, was not ready. And he also didn't want to answer that question. So, uh, I mean, I think it's still too early, but um, we will continue to see a crisis right. at the border, maybe at the Mexican side of the border. Julio Vaccaro, my colleague from Telemundo, who's reporting from Mexico City today. Julio, terrific stuff. Thank you so much. Uh, before we go, Thank you. I want to make note of the passing of perhaps the greatest professional football player ever to play the game. But more importantly, he had a big role in civil rights. Jim Brown died yesterday at his home. Brown was widely regarded as one of the greatest running backs of all time. He played just nine seasons for the Cleveland Browns, but oh, what a set of nine seasons they were. He retired early at the age of 30 to focus on social issues and to fight for equality for black Americans. He appeared on Meet the Press in June of 2016, days after the death of boxing great Muhammad Ali. What lessons should today's athletes take from you and Muhammad Ali and the things you did for them in the 60s? That money is not God and human dignity is very, very important. Your integrity is way up there. And as a single human being, if you carry yourself in a certain way, you can def defy all evil that comes at us. Sadly, Brown's legacy also includes a history of domestic violence. He was arrested a half a dozen times, mostly on charges of hitting women. He acknowledged that abuse, and he wrote that he regretted it 
in his 1989 memoir. Jim Brown was 87. That does it for us this hour. We're going to be back Monday with more Meet the Press now, but i got a whole lot more for you on Meet the Press all weekend long. It starts with this week's episode of Meet the Press Reports. The deep dive this week is on modern space exploration and the global race to Mars. That airs at 10.30 p.m. tonight and again Sunday morning right here on NBC News Now. And, of course, if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press on your local NBC News station. I have a slew of exclusive interviews. Governor Roy Cooper of North Carolina, the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, and Florida Congressman Republican Byron Donalds. Don't miss it. NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.